This is the Moots Route RSL, and dare I say it, N plus one is no more because this is N equals one. The route range was designed to be Moots's gravel, adventure, do it all type bike. Last year I rode the Route 45 at the Dirty Kanza and one thing I didn't really like about that bike was how upright the geometry felt. Luckily Moots were already making the RSL version of the route. The RSL denotes their more aggressive race orientated geometry. In this case it's 16 mil less stack but 9 mil more reach. For those unfamiliar with Moots, they're titanium specialists. They pride themselves on hand making these bikes in the Rockies with exquisite attention to detail. As you can see, the words on the bike are absolutely beautiful and they really are that stack of dimes that people love to talk about. The bike as you see it now isn't the original spec. When it first arrived it came with head Belgium Plus wheels with 30mm Schwalbe G1s. Now this was a great spec for when I first rode it which was during the classic season. I obviously didn't race the pro races but I did do the Paris-Roubaix Sportif and a lot of the Tour of Flanders route but not the official Sportif. Those wheels and tyres it's a really great combo for those really rough roads and it's a pretty savage start to life as a test bike but not as savage as Josh having to ride that Scott foil. This build was originally designed for the North American Handmade Bike Show. This is the actual one that was sent there and then sent to me. One of the big highlights on it is the limited edition Chris King Emerald Green finishing kit. You have the bottom bracket, external bottom bracket, always nice, the matching headset and on the head wheels the matching emerald green hubs. Moots went one step further with matching green decals, their own matching anodised bits and my favourite thing is the matching anodised spur cycle bell. With this being a showpiece bike it comes with the incredibly desirable Dura Ace Di2 and those with BDIs might have noticed the non-series shifters. Now it hasn't come with the new shifters because when this bike was built it was just a bit of a availability issues but these shifters they're pretty good they break really nicely nice chunky grips for long days in the saddle and yeah no real complaints but I have ridden the new Dura Ace Di2 and they're a lot smaller for those people with smaller hands you might want to consider the smaller shifters but non-series they do a good job this frame as you see here has clearance for 38 mil tyres in 700c format. For 2018 Moots have upped the clearance to 40 mil and that's what they call the dirty cans of clearance. Up front you can squeeze a bigger tyre in but in the rear there's not much wiggle room so for gravel riding you probably won't want to go much bigger than 42 in 650b format. This current spec is pretty much how I had it for the Jeroboam 300 that I rode with Jack and if you haven't seen those adventures, click on the link in the video description. One thing we noticed from the Jeroboam 300 is that fully loaded gravel bikes are very heavy. Just absolutely dying for an easier gear. And the gearing on this is a compact 5034 with an 1130 cassette at the back. And that 30 was quite welcome during the Jeroboam because it had extended climbs. The longest climb was close to two hours and on a bike that probably weighed about 13, 14 kilos fully loaded. Any help with the gearing was welcome. Throughout the year of riding this bike, it feels like it can be anything it wants to be, barring the extreme ends of cycling. You're almost certainly not going to be winning a hill climb on it and you're probably not going to be taken to the start line of the Tour Divide, but what exists in the middle ground it is very competent at. It's not just gravel riding that I've done on this bike. I have done some pretty long road rides. I did the Mallorca 312 earlier this year. It's one of my favorite events to do. I fitted the bike with my long-term MCFK 35 carbon wheels with 28 mil Schwalbe Pro ones, uh, tubeless. During the 312, I was constantly amazed at how comfortable the ride was. It's not just the wider tires, it's in combination with the compliant frame but that comfort didn't compromise speed and it just felt like I had so much grip that I could really nail it down some of those descents and through the corners. And I was surprised at just how high up I finished during the 312. So it just goes to show this is a bike that can do speed as well as all day comfort. In total, I've used four different wheel sets on this frame. 
these 3T650B ones, MTFK 35s, those head Belgian plus wheels, and the NV 5.6 disc, and they all change the characteristics of the ride. Regardless of what wheels you have on the bike, you've always got that frame in the middle that commands a highly capable ride feel. It can feel sluggish at times, there's no denying that. It's not going to accelerate with the deafness of a hill climb bike. I think when it first arrived, it just topped the scales about eight and a half kilos. But the overriding sense with a route frame is one of total confidence and comfort. Now, I'm not the most confident descender when it comes to off-road stuff, but during the Dirty Reaver this year, which is the UK's equivalent to the Dirty Kanza, I was pleasantly surprised that when I uploaded the route to Strava, I got a descent com. To me, that indicates that this is a frame when, in combination with good tyres, lets you open up those brakes without fear of vibration wobble or a sketchy, twitchy front end. Life of the bike has been relatively uncomplicated. You have flat mount disc calipers, you have 12mm front and rear through axle, although personally I think I'd prefer some sort of lever on the axles, you just need a 5mm allen key. Moots's own cinch seat post is really nice to work with, you have a choice of two allen keys to do two different things, a 5mm or a 6mm, the 6mm does fore and aft and the 5mm controls the tilt, they work independently so you're never having to balance one while you're doing the other. There's no weird torque bolts around in sizes that aren't on a multi-tool. The Chris King bits have worked flawlessly despite riding in some fairly grimy weather. It's all just kind of worked and isn't a faff like some bikes can be. Another nice touch is the externally routed rear brake hose. If you've ever had to deal with internal routing, it can be horrendous. So this is just a nice, easy thing to have. I guess the ethos of this bike is being able to do a whole range of things very competently, and it definitely does do that. Now I've ridden gravel races, big road rides, semi-lightish bike packing with the Jeroboam 300. I've done hill climb training on it. It's been my commuter. And throughout all those events, it's just been no stress. One thing that is stressful though, is the price. So you're probably gonna to wanna to sit down for this. In the original spec with those head wheels, it comes in at $12,000, which is a little over 9,000 pounds. The frame only option is $5,500, which is just over 4,000 pounds. If $12,000 is a bit out of your price range, they do offer some lower spec builds, which does lower the price, but it's still by no means cheap. So the classic question is if I had the money, which I definitely don't, would I buy this bike? I'd normally answer no, but with this one, I could be tempted to say yes. And that kind of brings me back to what I said at the beginning when N equals one. With a few choice wheel sets, it is definitely more than one bike. I'd be more than happy to have this frame as my road bike, my gravel bike, my adventure bike, my bike packing bike, and probably to some extent my cyclocross bike. So if you consider the cost of having those bikes individually, it kind of makes sense. It's also worth pointing out that titanium frames are incredibly long lasting. As long as you look after them, they could last as long as your riding career. So it is insanely expensive, but the route could be the last bike you'll ever need. And that's why this N equals one. <laughs>